Hi there. I'm Dean Walker. I'm the founder of a small organization on the interwebs called Living Resilience. And uh, that has a number of different components to it. Perhaps you've seen our, our uh, video podcast. It's a YouTube channel called The Poetry of Predicament. We're uh, celebrating our 10th year of the work of both Living Resilience and of course, that podcast, Poetry of Predicament. So we're we're very happy about that. And and uh, please tell your friends, uh, have them come on in and join us. Uh, it would be great to keep expanding. The video that you have just opened up to start it playing is uh, part of our most recent course, a uh, course that is open and available for people to join for this entire year from September 2024 to September 2025. It's called Islands of Sanity in a Mad World. And the point of it is to be the culmination of these 10 years of earlier iterations, evolutionary steps in offering support and resources and practices to both the collapse aware and collapse acceptant communities around the world. Um, it's not an easy task. You know, this is the most challenging conversation in human history, and to try and offer support and resources and practices that can help with a uh, person coping and, and making sense of and, and figuring out how to live a life in the face of what we are facing around the world, um, this is itself quite a challenge. So I'm um, very pleased to tell you about one monthly re repeating segment in the course material for this Islands of Sanity course, which, of course, how you can connect with this course, how you could sign up for and be a part of this course is all in the show notes down below. So you don't need to write anything down off the screen. So there's the information waiting for you if you want it. This repeating segment that I'm very, very pleased to be offering in this year-long course, Islands of Sanity, <clears throat> it is uh, called What We Are Up Against. I, uh, I don't think I'm alone in being just, just deathly sick of constant doom scrolling. I'm really tired of what has now become a constant 24-7 fire hose of all the bad news that's going on on the planet, whether it's human-caused collapse of Earth systems, it's human-caused collapse of human systems, and it is 24-7, and I call it the fire hose to the face. So you, I guess you can... You can imagine that I'm not particularly thrilled at um, continuing to expose myself to that 24-7 fire hose, nor am I willing to make it a significant part of, of any of the offerings here in Living Resilience, including Islands of Sanity. The closest we come is that each month of the 12 months, there will be some one piece of information some report that uh, significantly alters uh, a sane person's take on that particular type of collapse or predicament. So uh, this one is one of the first. The very first one was the uh, written article by uh, Julia Steinberger. I hope you will go back and and uh, read that if you haven't. It is uh, quite informative about a number of the elements that uh, anybody who is trying to be a, an activist in any way would want to have these pieces of very um, rare information. Unfortunately, in mainstream media, we just don't hear what's going to be in most of these, what we are up against segments in the islands of sanity course. This one is a brief clip from uh, late 2023, 
a conference in Sweden that Daniel Schmachtenberger, Nora Bateson, Nate Hagens, and others uh, were invited to speak. And uh, this is more or less a keynote speech or conversation uh, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, who is one of the most uh, brilliant people I've ever heard speak. I, and he is clearly one of the most able people I have ever ima even imagined to be engaging with a conversation of how do we live into a future that is made up of the these predicaments, these wicked problems that we are seeing around the world. He is extraordinary. Why I'm including this as over that line that justifies me including this kind of doom scrolling material in a very small dose is this is the most gravitas I've ever heard Daniel Schmachtenberger speak with. It is the most I have ever heard him just name what the contrast is between how human beings around the world are responding to the predicaments that we are facing and what is actually called for. And he makes it quite clear in a very few sentences that the difference between those two are immense. They're not looking good. And he is saying that in the most measured and gracious and compassionate way possible, but he is not mixing words either. So this is Daniel Schmachtenberger <clears throat> offering us a uh, an admonition, offering us uh, an invitation to shift the scale of our participation in what it is to be a human being at this time, to find dig, dig deep within ourselves, within our relationships, our families, our communities, and find some of the long lost agency. So um, I hope you find this useful. I find it useful in my experience in that it rattles me. It rattles me awake in a way that I thought I was awake. And uh, he ups the ante, if you will. He turns up the heat in the conversation and with the, with the uh, piercing nature of his assertions and then his invitation for us. I hope you'll join us in the rest of the months of islands of sanity in a mad world in the living resilience space. It would be great to have you. I look forward to meeting you soon. Thanks. Reflections on Impact Week um, yesterday and today. I was sitting in the audience and I was listening to Nate and Olivia and Kate today and, um, you know, these are people whose work I respect deeply and who are saying some of the most important things that can be said and are brilliant educators. And I was feeling... Uh, I was feeling the sense of the recognition that it probably doesn't matter at all. That <clears throat> most everybody will leave and probably continue working the jobs that they work, doing mostly the same types of things. And they will remember what happened, like, okay, we're destroying the atmosphere, we're boiling the oceans, we're killing all the other species, we're doing it at the cost of colonialism, we're on the way towards extinction, and that will last in people's minds till they scroll for a minute, until a bunch of messages come in and until the bills need paid at most. And <clears throat> I'm thinking about the talks that Bohm and Krishnamurti gave in the 80s saying very similar things about civilization being on a self-destruct path or that Bucky gave it after World War II, and the people who listened earnestly and everything they were saying has come to pass, and those curves keep doing the same thing. And I'm, I was thinking about the Nuremberg trials, where after World War II, when the Nazis were being tried for war crimes, uh, 
one of the things they were asked was if they believed in everything they were doing. And something like 90% of them said no. At first, they believed the kind of propaganda of uh, the Jewish attack on their population and whatever. <clears throat> but as it got into uh, gassing children, uh, something like 90% of the people who were doing that said, no, I totally didn't believe in it and I thought it was terrible. And then when they were asked, did you try to stop, they all said no. And they quoted German phrases that translated to something like officer's orders, I didn't have a choice. And <clears throat> I, think about, I think about all the things that we would consider impact like that was just normal life in Tibet before Mao invaded. When we talk about having a civilization that has deeper consideration for other sentient beings and deeper interiority, and Tibet was pretty great at that, and it didn't lead, it didn't lead to their civilization continuing when a more power-oriented civilization wanted to end it. Uh, I think about when we're talking about the the impending catastrophes, I think about the 100 million Native Americans that were genocided for my country to exist just a minute ago. And we like to, ha we talk about like the values of Western civilization, but you know, modern democracy in the United States occurred on a 100 million person genocide and massive slavery, as well as the destruction of the species. And, and that, genocide was in this part of the exponential curve that is now verticalizing and people don't have an intuition for how fast it goes from here. And I'm thinking about all of the Chinese soldiers who are going into Tibet murdering um, nuns and priests and destroying that culture and that similarly they were mostly people who loved their kids and were moral people before being called into that situation. And so I'm thinking about when I, when I was reflecting like what does it take for any of this knowledge to matter? I don't know about the other speakers. I hate public speaking. You were mentioning the fear of it, like this is a miserable um, experience for me. I feel an obligation to have more people understand more of the situation they find themselves in and hopefully care more deeply One last thing, and then we'll go back to your questions. I was, I was on a call with a friend the other day who has done very successful work in um, public health globally. And it's a good guy. He's a good guy who is used to working on how to make the world better through institutional means, the United Nations and things like that. And he engaged on some projects that we were working on regarding artificial intelligence risks and synthetic biology risks, which are not obvious on the map shared earlier. The map shared earlier, we're talking about largely the effect of industrial era tech on planetary boundaries. Um, but industrial era tech gives rise to uh, digital era tech, which moves radically faster, right? When you look at the speed at which GPT got used by 100 million users, or threads then in five days getting used by 100 million users compared to how quick it took the steam engine to be used by that many people. But also the impact of it, and just briefly in case people don't know, because this will add something to the Metacris, uh, to the thesis of what's been shared so far in terms of the risk we face. The poly crisis is a term more people are familiar with, which um, is really good. I'm very happy about the poly crisis becoming more aware so that um, more common in awareness so people aren't reductively focused on climate or social justice or whatever one issue they were coming from, but recognizing there are many different critical issues facing the world and that they're interconnected and that there are cascades from one to the other and they need considered together, which is unbelievably important. The, we more talk about the meta crisis, which is just a slight distinction in terms of the, it's not just that there's a lot of different crises and that they're moving towards global catastrophic risks, but that they have underlying dynamics that give rise to them that have to be addressed. Um, but one of the other distinctions is a, a different way of taxonomizing the problem space and the issues of advanced technology get some more emphasis. So probably, I mean, I know, um, 
Nick Bostrom and Anders Sandberg and um, uh, Max Tegmark are Swede, so everybody here is probably actually fairly aware of AI risk more than in lots of places. Um, but, you know, there was a, some studies done in the U.S. just in the last couple weeks on the relationship between the publicly deployed large language models, GPT-4-like things, but the ones that have been jailbroken so that they don't have the same restrictions on them, and pretty much everyone that has been deployed has either been leaked, reverse engineered, or jailbroken uh, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and the relationship between those and biological development tools, the ability to synthesize genomes of pathogens and things like that, and just asking questions to an AI that can talk to you that knows all of chemistry that is published on Wikipedia and online, knows all of biology, knows all of current technology, which would normally be a radically huge team needed to do that, and being able to ask questions like, which companies provide gene synthesis tools that are not government monitored, where I can buy gene synthesis tools without uh, triggering uh, oversight? And what are the most virulent pathogens? And how many people could I kill for $100,000? and questions like that, and it answering. And this is totally nuclear weapons level catastrophic capability, but unlike nuclear, you just have to have an information packet to be able to use it. The knowledge of how to do that travels the speed of light on the internet, radically decentralized, can't be limited to G8. And so <clears throat> the, and yet from the economic perspective of what, um, every speaker today was talking about exponential curve goes up, software seems like the answer to planetary boundaries, <laughs> right? Because we get to keep getting more economic growth without having to use as many resources per dollar. Awesome. We're definitely moving forward as fast as possible with AI in the US in the hope that it'll fix the stagflation and allow us to deal with the economic uh, situation. But it's dual use, it's omni-use, it's basically meaning you develop it for one purpose, but it enables everybody to do every purpose that they have. And the radical enablement of the distribution of human purposes as they exist today is super problematic. But the, the thing that I was talking to my friend about is we were working on these issues. How do we regulate that type of AI and that type of synthetic biology that has nuclear level catastrophic capabilities, but that non-state actors can get. And he was suggesting to me that uh, oh, we have to, that he'd already made action on this. We have to make a public-private partnership where we get all the big AI companies and all the big um, synthetic bio companies involved because they're the only ones who know the information and they're the only ones that can move fast enough because government moves too slow. And um, they'll be able to come up with the regulation for themselves. And he was serious. He was actually serious about this. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> are, are you kidding about this? And they're like, and I said, we can't have any revolving doors in this. The people who are regulating the tech cannot have a vested interest in the tech not getting heavily regulated. And he got so frustrated at me. He's like, Daniel, everything in DC is rotating doors. And I'm like, I know, that's why we're going to go extinct. And he, got so frustrated he almost had to hang up because he's like, you're being so unrealistic because this is how regulation in the world works. And I'm like, you're being so unrealistic, you're pretending a biosphere can continue to exist. And the issue is that he was grounded in the reality of human history as it has been so far. And I was trying to ground in physics and biology because we don't get to change those in the same ways and the two aren't compatible. So I have to be unrealistic to history as it has been so far, if I want to be able to think about how to make a human technological civilization compatible with the biosphere and itself and its own continuity. And I think, yeah, one thing, like if I'm gonna express what I was reacting to today is that I do believe we're at the end of history. Like eminently in the lifetimes of everyone in this room, we're at the end of history. Meaning we're at the end of a human civilization defined by the major defining characteristics that what we call written human history from early Egypt or Sumeria or whatever was defined by, which is the, it didn't, 
if you had a peaceful civilization and Genghis Khan wanted that area or Alexander the Great wanted that area, your peaceful civilization was wiped out. And the same is true if you have a, if you want to internalize all of the cost of carbon, your country is going to get destroyed geopolitically by whoever externalizes that cost and concentrates the profits. The, the thing that has been more successfully dominant, extracted more, grown its population more, increased its violence capability wins. And that thing with exponential tech at planetary boundaries self-terminates. So either we're at the end of our species or we're at the end of our species being defined by those parameters. And the end of our species being defined by those parameters requires I think the last thing I'll say when I was thinking about the, the Nazis and everyone else in those situations is the famous quote, lots of people have said a quote like this, that it's the complicity of the weak with the wicked that allows the evils of the world to happen. Most of the Nazis were not Hitler, but Hitler couldn't have done shit without a lot of people who obeyed. Most of the Mongols were not Genghis Khan. Most of us are not the people that make the choice to f make up bullshit reasons for wars that are false flag for truly economic and geopolitical reasons, but we will still not get in the way of that thing happening. The, Iraq war that started all of the recent rounds of wars because of the weapons of mass destruction that we knew they didn't have, where are the prosecutions for that? Because four and a half million people were murdered as a result of that. There are a small number of people who um, are motivated by power exclusively, pretty exclusively, and then there's most everyone else who just needs to pay the bills and not rock the boat too much and wants to feel like they will do good things within the confines of that. So I guess I don't, I don't want people to think about how to make their own life regenerative because it doesn't matter. I don't want people to think about how to make Sweden regenerative. I want people to think about what it would take to turn the entire arc of humanity, factoring what is currently driving it, and that everything else that you could do doesn't matter at all because the end of the possibility space of all meaningful human activities is eminent if we don't do that. That's what I'm reflecting on.